Are you Robert Scott Lazar? Yes. About whether you have lied about flying saucers or antimatter control, do you intend to answer my questions truthfully? Yes. Did you knowingly lie when you said that you had actually seen anti gravity propulsion in operation? No. Did you knowingly lie when you said you had seen an antimatter reactor? No. Did you knowingly lie when you said that you actually saw a 30-odd foot gravity-powered flying disc? No. This week we've heard the contention of UFO researchers that there is a secret government within our government. While that may be hard to believe coming from the UFO perspective, we've certainly learned in Watergate and the Iran-Contra scandal that factions within our government can and do pursue their own hidden agendas outside of the law, outside the control of Congress, or the knowledge of the American people. This is exactly the type of operation we'll hear about tonight. It's a chilling scenario with worldwide implications that may have its roots right here. Area 51, that mysterious corner of the Nevada test site, is no longer much of a secret. The fact that secretive things go on here is a given, even to the Soviets, who make daily spy flights over the facility to take a peek at what's going on. These photos, never before shown in public, are about as close as anyone will ever come to seeing what the place looks like again. The dry bed of Groom Lake, corrugated metal buildings, a three-mile-long runway, and some highly sophisticated radar and detection equipment. It's been known by many names over the years, Dreamland, The Ranch, The Skunk Works. If ever there was a place to test a secret new technology, this is it. And that's exactly what's been done here for decades. 51 is where stealth technology was nurtured, where Star Wars devices are still tested, and where all manner of CIA monkey business has been plotted and refined. It's the perfect place for secret things. But of course, that's no secret. 51 is ringed by the forbidden vastness of the Nevada test site, by the looming Groom Mountains, and by sparsely populated desert expanses. Speculation was heightened in 1984 when the Air Force seized nearly 90,000 acres around Groom Lake. The action was, by most accounts, illegal. During congressional hearings about the land grab, Congressman John Cyberling grilled the military about the legal authority used in the action and was told the authority was at a much, much higher level than the Air Force. Cyberling asked what authority is higher than the laws of the United States. The Air Force official said he could respond, but only in a closed briefing. In 1987, when the Air Force sought to renew its stranglehold on the Groom Range, news articles once again mentioned the talk about alien spacecraft and subsequent articles in national magazines quoted unnamed sources about things of alien origin flying in Nevada, things that would make filmmaker George Lucas drool. Despite the speculation, no one who knew Area 51 from the inside ever talked publicly about the saucer stories. Well, there's several, uh, actually nine, uh, 
flying saucers, flying discs uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. The live interview with the shadowy Dennis drew international attention. Portions were broadcast by radio in six European countries and in a nationally televised TV special in Japan. Actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs. Despite numerous inquiries and feelers, Dennis has remained anonymous until now. His real name is Robert Lazar, a young scientist with eclectic interests. The choice of Dennis was an inside joke. He says that's the name of his superior at Groom Lake. It wasn't a joke to Dennis. He called right after and said, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? And I, I said, well, no. <laughs> he hung up the phone. Lazar's story is by any standards fantastic. He says he's telling it in order to protect himself. He says he was hired to work at an area called S4, which is a few miles south of Groom Lake. At S4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. Right, this, this came from somewhere else. I mean, as bizarre as that is to believe, but I mean, it's there. I saw it. I know what the current state of the art is and in, in physics, and it's, it can't be done. Checking out Lazar's credentials proved to be a difficult task. He says he earned degrees in physics and electronics, but the schools we contacted say they've never heard of him. He also said he worked as a physicist at Los Alamos National Lab, where he experimented with one of the world's largest particle beam accelerators, a half-mile-long behemoth capable of generating 700 million volts. Los Alamos officials told us they had no records of a Robert Lazar ever working there. They were either mistaken or were lying. A 1982 phone book from the lab lists Lazar right there among the other scientists and technicians. A 1982 clipping from the Los Alamos newspaper profiled Lazar and his interest in jet cars. It too mentioned his employment at the lab as a physicist. We called Los Alamos again. An exasperated official told us he still had no records on Lazar. EG&G, which is where Lazar says he was interviewed for the job at S4, also has no records. It's as if someone has made him disappear. Well, they're trying to make me a non-person. Explain. You called where? Well, the schools that I went to, the hospital that I was born at, uh, past job, and uh, essentially nothing comes up with my name in it. He smiles, but out of futility, knowing the whole thing must sound ridiculous. I did not believe that this should be a security matter. Some of it, sure. But just the concept that there's definite proof, and uh, we even have articles from another world, another system. You just can't not tell everyone. Ward Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. Are you Robert Scott Lazar? Yes. About whether you have lied about flying saucers or antimatter control, do you intend to answer my questions truthfully? Yes. Did you knowingly lie when you said that you had actually seen anti gravity propulsion in operation? No. Did you knowingly lie when you said you had seen an antimatter reactor? Did you knowingly lie when you said that you actually saw a 30-odd foot gravity-powered flying disc? No.
this is the hard part of the story for people to understand. It's uh, they 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 don't really get a sense of what it was like because really, literally, you had to be there for some of this. I lived through it. I I know what it was like. What Bob was going through at that time. They were breaking into his house and playing mind games. You know, they'd leave the doors open. They'd leave drawers open. Nothing's taken. They'd write things on his blackboard or erase things, move things around. He goes to the gym with his with his buddy, and he's kind of scared, so he's got an Uzi in his car. He comes out an hour later after working out, the doors to the car are open, the windows are down, the glove box is open, and the Uzi is laying there on the front seat. That wasn't a burglary, that was somebody messing with him. That stuff really happened. It's both uh, frightening and infuriating. Do you, on a deeper level, trust Bob's story now than before what you take away from it 25 years later, after sitting down with Bob and hearing him tell this story with the same details. He's not adding any stuff to it. He doesn't have to worry about remembering the truth because he remembers the same version, the same story, the same way, same details. And he's telling things that actually happened to him. Uh, I tend to, it, it, it carries a lot of weight with me. I, uh, 25 years later, still telling the same story, reluctantly, by the way. This is a reluctant UFO messiah. The only reason he came out uh, to talk to us again is because I bugged him about it uh, relentlessly. Come on, Bob, when are you coming out? Uh, Are we there yet? Kind of a, uh, and he finally relented and came out, but he wasn't happy about it. Nothing good comes from the UFO field for him. It does nothing but cause him trouble. If he had to do it over again, I I suspect he wouldn't do it uh, because it changed his life. And there was a part of him, as he said in our most recent conversation, there's a part of them that would really like to still be working on that stuff. I mean, it was really amazing technology, the most amazing technology he's ever seen. I think I believe the story more than it did before. The idea that Bob was a disinformation agent or part of a, a program to mislead the public is wrong. I, he's not. And I can say that after knowing the guy for a quarter of a century. The story he told then is the story he tells now. He didn't add to it. He's not making it more elaborate. Uh, He's not remembering new parts of it. It's the same story. It's consistent all the way through. All right. Well, we'll take it from the top then. I mean. Okay. Well, go ahead. (laughs) Uh, How you got involved with this program? I had sent resumes to several national labs around the country. Uh, I got a response from a couple of them. They said, we might have something in the near future you would be very interested in. You know, you you say you work on little projects. I said, yeah, I have a particle accelerator in my master bedroom and and things of that sort. And uh, some time went by and they called me back in. They said uh, there was a, a senior staff physicist that was leaving. Uh, this organization, and they basically interviewed me for that job. Okay, you're there on the first day. What happens on the first day? First day was when I read most of the briefings. 121 of these things. Right. I read them. What what did they say? Through some reaction, it produces a, a gravity field that's not completely understood. One of the things that they were teaching me was the physics that that connect all this together. To create fields and power such as these disks required to do what they do, to lift off the ground uh, without a body of a propulsion system, requires a tremendous amount of energy, and this is the only way they can achieve it. How does that work? I mean, how how does that field become useful? It's the most potent energy source that there can be. just as a, a rough guesstimate, uh, a kilogram of antimatter is equal in energy to 47 10 megaton hydrogen bombs. It's an extremely potent energy source. It's a direct conversion of matter to energy. If you want to tell the full story of John Lear, you have to cover the story of Bob Lazar. And the only way to do that is to talk to Bob. And I don't know if he'll talk to you or not, but you need to try. 
Well, it was, it's all going to be circumstance for you, is the moment that you approach him, the mood that he's in, what else is going on in his life at the time. You might hit the jackpot and get him at exactly the right time and the, the universe is aligned and he's willing to talk about it, but you'd have to be awfully lucky. Uh, because in general, Bob doesn't like to talk about it. I think he's very happy in his life. He's happy to have left the UFO stuff behind. He misses his friends. He misses John Lear. He misses Gene Huff, maybe even me to some extent. Uh, but he doesn't miss the UFO topic and he doesn't miss talking about it because ultimately it's disturbing. These are disturbing issues. They go to the heart of who we are as people as human beings, the nature of reality itself. Is this a computer simulation? Are we all the product of an alien video game or some multi-dimensional movie, drive-in movie theater production or something? Big questions, disturbing answers. And Bob has never been comfortable in talking about them, never. You know, look, <laughs> you can nitpick anything, you know, to the point where you find inconsistencies and then you can add those inconsistencies up and say, you know what, this can't be true. But the thing is, you can do that with factual events. And this was a factual event. Where, I mean, where the project is now, where the parts are now, you know, this is all 20 years ago. So I know there are alien craft here from another planet. I Now, I saw other ones, but I was inside one. I know it was not made on Earth. I know it was made with materials that we cannot fabricate, we cannot duplicate, and we've never been able to. I know it uses a power source that's so advanced that you know, we could only dream of something along those lines. And the energy density on it is phenomenal. It's nothing that to, I, I would ever expect to see. Um, I know that you know, this is done in the highest levels of security and, you know, that they use all kinds of methods to keep it quiet, from disinformation to, uh, uh, I mean, some exotic ways of just hiding things. Like I said, the installation itself was buried in the side of a mountain and, you know. Uh, I also know that there's lots of nonsense information that has gone around and whether it was started by the Navy or military or whoever's at the absolute bottom, you know, of the project. Uh, and I, I truly suspect that be the case because, look, disinformation is the most powerful, you know, way to distort facts. You just throw a bunch of useless stuff out there and, you know, they just take the real facts along with the nonsense and bundle it together and say, well, this is just impossible and, you know, there, your security is maintained. But uh, I also know that at some point they've examined or had bodies of alien creatures somewhere. So I know that stuff for a fact. And mm, that's the bottom line. Well, I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that. Uh, what's going on up there could be the most important event in history. You're talking about contact, physical, <laughs> physical contact and proof of, from another another system, another planet, another intelligence. That's got to be the biggest event in history, period. And it's real. And it's real and it's there. Lazar says he has no intention of going on any UFO lecture circuit. He's not looking to do any additional interviews. In fact, he wasn't too crazy about doing this one. He did it after certain unfavorable things started happening in his life, and he did it because he feels that whoever is running the show up at S4 is perpetrating a fraud on the American people and on the scientific community. You believe his story, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I've, I've got to know him uh, pretty well over the last couple of months, and uh, I believe he's telling the truth.
Nothing good comes from the UFO field for him. This is a reluctant UFO messiah. It changed his life. This week we've heard the contention of UFO researchers that there is a secret government within our government. Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. The live interview with the shadowy dentist drew international attention. Portions were broadcast by radio in six European countries and in a nationally televised TV special in Japan. Despite numerous inquiries and feelers, Dennis has remained anonymous until now. His real name is Robert Lazar. He says he was hired to work at an area called S4, which is a few miles south of Groom Lake. At S4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. I did not believe that this should be a security matter. Some of it, sure, but just the concept that there's definite proof we even have articles from another world, another system. You just can't not tell everyone. It was like a Twilight Zone episode. It just kept getting stranger. The fact that that was happening at all was the weirdest part. Look, it's been 30 years, and all of a sudden you raised it to this level? You know, this is a powerful technology, fearsome technology, and you just don't want everyone to have it. It'll become obvious how to make constructive as well as destructive devices from it. It's my only guess as to why they have never released information. It's kind of difficult once you release the technology to be analyzed and give it to everyone. They can just run with it. You really can't keep the weapon potential hidden. You really can't. Look, with ET technology, you can literally rule the world. Well, I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that. Uh, what's going on up there could be the most important event in history. You're talking about contact, physical, <laughs> physical contact and proof of, uh, from another, another system, another planet, another intelligence. That's got to be the biggest event in history, period. And it's real. And it's real and it's there. This week we've heard the contention of UFO researchers that there is a secret government within our government. Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. The live interview with the shadowy dentist drew international attention. Portions were broadcast by radio in six European countries and in a nationally televised TV special in Japan. Despite numerous inquiries and feelers, Dennis has remained anonymous until now. His real name is Robert Lazar. He says he was hired to work at an area called S4, which is a few miles south of Groom Lake. At S4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. This is like a powerful technology, fearsome technology, and you just don't want everyone to have it. And it'll become obvious how to make constructive as well as destructive devices from it. Once you release the technology to be analyzed and give it to everyone, they can just run with it. You really can't keep the weapon potential hidden. Look, with ET technology, you can literally rule the world. I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that. Physical contact and proof of, from another, another system, another planet, another intelligence. That's got to be the biggest event in history, period. And it's real. And it's real and it's there.
this line was really strong. Let me see if you can do um, how much can a man take before he submits to the way? And this is, does he fade back into the shadows that formed him? Okay. How much can a man take before he submits to the weight, the consequence of distrust? Does he fade back into the shadows that formed him? Or does he lash out to carve his words into your flesh? To carve his words into your flesh? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine, uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. This story is extraordinary, especially if it's true. And it all started in the desert, just north of Las Vegas. A local scientist who's worked at Groom Lake said to be where top secret weapon systems have been tested over the years. He has asked that his identity be shielded. Exactly what's going on up there. What's going on up there could be the most important event in history. Physical contact and proof of, from another, another system, another planet, another intelligence. What would happen to you if the government learned that you were giving us this information? He just wanted to stay alive. Maybe this has been kept from us for a good reason. Sir, how do we know you are who you say you are? My name's Bob Lazar. I'm known for working at a classified base and reverse engineered alien spacecraft. And it went all over the world. He put Area 51 on the map. Can we ever be made whole if we're not believed? We can't verify what was going on in his background. I have no motivation to lie. The science and the technology can change us. We've always looked to the skies for answers instead of looking into ourselves. only record of this is going to be on the audio on this one file and then this video clip. I'm not going to cut it, I'm going to let it run. Understood. Okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to encrypt it and I'm going to put both of those two files into an encrypted thing to not be touched unless we decide it should be touched. That's fine. Okay, it'll be on two drives but that those two files will both be in an encrypted folder. So here's the deal. Did you ever get a piece of Element 115 out of Los Alamos? I don't know how much monitoring they do with me. I'm sure it's virtually none after all this time. Hold on the one same second. Thing. Hold on one second. Let me. Um, do you have your phone on you? Yes. Um, let's at this point uh, take our phone. Let me just throw them. Let me put them in the ground over there. I'll turn mine off. Maybe this has been kept from us for a good reason. A lot of people agreed to keep this secret. So first of all, who am I to upset it? And second of all, who am I to outthink these guys? Maybe they went over all these scenarios already and they know how fucked up everything will be. So there's no guarantee that this revelation is gonna make everything great. It could, there's just as much chance it's gonna make everything terrible and I'll be to blame for that. Well, there's several, uh actually nine flying saucers, flying discs uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. The mountains appear to float on dry lake beds, like spaceships from another world. They seem to ride on a viscous material channeled through empty space by heat that rises and separates. It vitrifies everything it contacts. Like a, like a green glass honey. A goddamn psychedelic liquid drowning the emptiness with imagination. With imagination. This desert is pocked and punctuated by a thousand gaping holes 
created in a thousand atomic blasts that defined an era. What are they building in the desert north of Las Vegas? What are they hiding? What are they hiding? What the fuck are they hiding? I have actually watched a craft do maneuvers one night for about 20 minutes. Even today, ever seen anything that could really move as fast. <laughs> Don't open the door, because then the bugs come in. <laughs> well, get a few more goodies. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Pat Travis. I own The Little Alien in beautiful downtown Rachel, Nevada. The Little Alien started in 1988, actually in 1990, but my late husband and I have owned The Little Alien for since 1988. We were newcomers to Rachel. Well, just after that, the UFO activity started, and it was like a gift that was put in our hands, and we needed something for us. We had added a couple of motel rooms, so here we are with more and better now. Nice. Next time, sp stay the night. <laughs> are we ready to roll again? We had tour groups earlier today, and it's just you go in, you do what you have to do, and then come out and mingle with everybody. That's what life's all about. This isn't work, this is fun. There are people that come here from every country in the world. And if you look at all the dollar bills that are signed on our ceiling, you'll see so many different countries. Every state in the United States people have been here from. And it's awesome. And this is really where things started, you know, and, and it's been something that keeps going on. The one question that everybody asks is, how do I get to Area 51? Uh, it just goes without saying. So we give them, we have a little map, we teach them directions and let them go. And we've had some that don't like to listen to us. You've got to pay attention. It is a high secure area. Every country in the world has this type, but ours is really well known. So. The world's best known secret base because of Bob Lazar. That's it. And when there are secrets, everybody wants to know a little bit about that secret. You know, when Bob Lazar and George Knapp, John Lear, Gene Huff, it was just a whole group that was, continued to go. And it was all something that was brought here and given to us. And a lot of articles were written because of so many different sightings of so much, so many different things that it's like a snowball and there's no end to this. People come here from around the world to talk about sightings. Do I believe all of them? Probably not, but there are many of them I do because when you talk to somebody, you know whether they're really projecting something, or if it's kind of just a story. Do you believe Bob Lazar? Oh, without a doubt. If a man is going to tell a lie about something, it changes because you don't remember all those things. If you tell the truth about something, it always stays the same. Can I prove it? No, but I can tell you when I tell that, my arms will cover with goosebumps. It's happening now. Do I believe that there are aliens that walk among us? Without a doubt. I have no qualms about that. It's happened here more than once. That's a fact. monitoring they do with me I'm sure it's virtually none after all this time hold on, the one same second. Thing. hold on one second let me um, do you have your phone on you yes um, let's at this point uh, take our phone let me just throw them let me put them in the ground over there I'll turn mine off I 
I mean, maybe this has been kept from us for a good reason. A lot of people agreed to keep this secret. So, first of all, who am I to upset it? And second of all, who am I to outthink these guys? Maybe they went over all these scenarios already and they know how fucked up everything will be. So, there's no guarantee that this revelation is gonna make everything great. It could, there's just as much chance it's gonna make everything terrible and I'll be to blame for that. They identified themselves as FBI and um, they uh, said, you're Bob Lazar, right? And then, you know, one of them got on the radio saying, yeah, he's here. Apparently, they also had my house staked out. And they were deciding whether or not to go there. The conveyor belt of vehicles and agents and police did not stop. The whole thing it was like a Twilight Zone episode. They came in and then they said, there'll be a few other people coming here. Just got a couple questions to ask you. In a short time, the street filled up with vehicles and the building completely filled with agents. It was really something else. Did they identify themselves initially as Yeah, FBI? it was FBI identified themselves, then came in state police and a few other agencies. I don't remember who, but um, there were a lot. Not a lot. Standing room only in, in the building. It was it was crazy. Yeah, they had like a forensic truck. They had a bunch of different agents. They gridded off the building. I mean, obviously they're they're looking for something. Yeah, yeah. And what they said, they were looking for some paperwork, an old order from two years ago, about a customer that uh, you know ordered some potentially toxic material, which you know, they could have called for. But uh, this was certainly way over the top. I looked up to select the right key, and they were right beside me. It was quite surprising, considering you could see all around here, and there would generally have to be a vehicle or something somewhere. But I just pulled up, got out, picked the key, and then they started talking from behind me. I thought that was really strange. Of course, it got much stranger as the day went on. What, what got stranger about it? Well, just the sheer amount of people that came, agency after agency. And, I mean, they had computer experts here going through, you know, all the computer equipment we had here. They had people sectioning off the building, labeling it in cubic meters so they can search each one. You know, what they were looking for was just a, an order form. So, very strange. scientist who's worked at Groom Lake said to be where top secret weapon systems have been tested over the years. He has asked that his identity be shielded. Exactly what's going on up there. What's going on up there could be the most important event in history. Physical contact and proof of, uh, from another another system, another planet, another intelligence. What would happen to you if the government learned that you were giving us this information? He just wanted to stay alive. Maybe this has been kept from us for a good reason. Sir, how do we know you are who you say you are? My name's Bob Lazar. I'm known for working at a classified base and reverse engineered alien spacecraft. It went all over the world. He put Area 51 on the map. Can we ever be made whole if we're not believed? can't verify what was going on in his background. I have no motivation to lie. The science and the technology can change us. We've always looked to the skies for answers instead of looking into ourselves. Jeremy Corbell, 
Hello, hey, nice to have you, you back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I know last time we had you on, we were talking about Skinwalker Ranch, and then we were hinting yeah. about how you were like eyeballs deep in the edit for Bob Lazar, right. Area 51, and Flying Saucers. The reason I made this movie is because I'm fascinated. I want to know too. This is what inspired me when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Is this real? Is this true? So my whole goal is to get people talking about it. If you watch the movie, you will come out of it knowing more about Bob and his story, especially if you've never heard about it before. Even if you have, there's at least seven points of new information in the movie. My name's Bob Lazar. I'm known for working at a classified base known as S4 out in the Nevada desert near Area 51. And there, we reverse engineered alien spacecraft. And it's changed my life a lot. You know, it's probably changed every aspect of it. Positive or negative? Well, for the most part, negative. I mean, I'd, it's really difficult to find positive aspects of that. I mean, I'm sure there are some here and there, but most of them were, were negative. So that's important that everybody watches the movie, but why it's so important now that you hear Bob Lazar's story is because in December of 2017, we heard our government had a UFO program that was called ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. However, there was a mother program that was called AWSAP, Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Application Program. That was a Defense Intelligence Agency program to study related phenomenon to UFOs. So why Bob's story is so important now, we have Lou Elizondo, who's the head of this government program to study UFOs. There's a UFO program, not just Project Blue Book, like the new series that's out and all that stuff. It's an old program, 1969, it ended. There's a new program. Bob Lazar says he worked in a government program to work on power and propulsion. So not UFO identification for the military, but another program. I will tell you here now, and I've said it before, there are a multitude of UFO programs currently and from past that are actively studying different elements of the UFO phenomenon from biology to crash retrieval. So I think in time, what I'm saying now will be proven, uh, maybe there'll be these four programs I mentioned before that are named, let's see. Yeah. But there are more than that. And I think over time we're gonna learn that historically the Bob Lazar testimony is important and so you be the judge of it he's told you his story because mm -hmm. he felt it's important for you to know that there is a science and a technology that is being held from you and that technology can change the world and we already know about it and it's non-terrestrial and i think that's what he wants you to know take it or leave it uh, bob just wants to live his normal life he, he never wants to do this stuff i begged him to do it so yeah. you know, i think he's i think he's done i think he's told you his story again i'll try to get him for some q and a's when i when i show my movie or that kind of thing but he just wants to live his normal life, but he felt it important to untwist mm -hmm. his story the way people have twisted it over 30 years. I keep saying this and I mean it. You know, the, the, his critics have had the mic for, for more than 30 years and we took the mic back. And that's the point, telling you his side of the story now. You're telling me there's a different physics. That was your job. You were working on that. The science was something we were trying to figure out, but we knew how the devices would operate. You know, for instance, the propulsion of the craft. Everything that we have, whether it's a propeller plane or a jet or a rocket, it throws something out the back, either high-speed exhaust or a large volume of air. It's an action-reaction force. The action is you throw something out the back and it moves you forward. That's how everything works. This is the first time there's a craft that's it's a reactionless craft. It's a field propulsion craft. And what it does is it creates a distortion in space and time in front of it, where space actually bends. And my analogy to that has always been, put a bowling ball in the middle of your bed, and then a foot in front of it, take your fist and push down on the mattress. The bowling ball will roll towards it. And that's exactly how the craft works. It creates a distortion right in front of it, and the craft falls forward. There, so there's a different physics that we're not... Well, the science that explains how the technology works. I mean, it's all encompassed as one thing, alien technology and science. What is the big picture? What, are the, what is the takeaway of your story after you're gone? You're not a, a rebel kid with a, with a jet car at Los Alamos today. Today's a different 
Bob Lazar, right? Right. But what have we learned? What's What's the message of your story? What's the big thing is the suppression of extremely advanced technology and the suppression of unknown science. That's it. Those two things, to me, is the only thing that's important about what was going on out there. Yeah, an there's another civilization, and like I've said before, that's a crime not to tell humanity about that, but that's a separate thing. Meaning that, that there is something different in science, dramatically, that we're not allowed to know? Right. Right. That is a true statement. Yeah, that's a true statement. The fact that there is another intelligent, technologically advanced civilization, we have some of their objects. That is really the pinnacle. That there is another civilization in existence that's intelligent that we know about. And we actually have artifacts from them that can operate. So, I mean, that's, that's a big, big deal. But in my mind, that's, there's a lot to deal with that. However, the science and the technology can change us dramatically. It can change the way the entire world operates, the economy, everything. So those stick out in my mind as being critically important. And we have it. Oh, we have them. You don't have to believe it, but we do. And you've seen it. I've seen it. And you've touched it. I've dismantled it. Now that this is um, kind of out of your wheelhouse, you get to calm down a little bit. I am sure, knowing you, you have another project right on the on the back end. So. I do, but I'm not going to tell you this time, Jessica. <laughs> no, not, not this time. Oh, come no, on, we're friends, no. dude. I know, but there's so much going on right now, and there's so much more to tell. I have so much more to give from the footage that I haven't released yet. Mm -hmm. You're going to find a lot. Like I'm releasing through my YouTube channel, stuff like that. You're going to find a lot of content and information. Uh, coming out in the next year from me. Thank you so much. Jeremy Corbell, everybody, for joining us. Uh, congratulations on the movie. Um, we will see you guys next week, and bye! Nothing good comes from the UFO field for him. This is a reluctant UFO messiah. It changed his life. This week we've heard the contention of UFO researchers that there is a secret government within our government. Well, there are several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. The live interview with the shadowy dentist drew international attention. Portions were broadcast by radio in six European countries and in a nationally televised TV special in Japan. Despite numerous inquiries and feelers, Dennis has remained anonymous until now. His real name is Robert Lazar. He says he was hired to work at an area called S4, which is a few miles south of Groom Lake. At S4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. I did not believe that this should be a security matter. Some of it, sure. But just the concept that there's definite proof we even have articles from another world, another system. You just can't not tell everyone. It was like a Twilight Zone episode. It just kept getting stranger. The fact that that was happening at all was the weirdest part. Look, it's been 30 years, and all of a sudden you raised it to this level? You know, this is a powerful technology, fearsome technology, and you just don't want everyone to have it. It'll become obvious how to make constructive as well as destructive devices from it. It's my only guess as to why they have never released information. It's kind of difficult once you release the technology to be analyzed and give it to everyone. They can just run with it. You really can't keep the weapon potential hidden. You really can't. Look, with ET technology, you can literally rule the world.
Well, I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that. Uh, what's going on up there could be the most important event in history. You're talking about contact, physical, <laughs> physical contact and proof of, from another, another system, another planet, another intelligence. That's got to be the biggest event in history, period. And it's real. And it's real and it's there. Bob Lazar's not full of shit. Nope. All they did was kill his credibility by making people think he was crazy. That's how you kill anyone's credibility. Oh no, that person is crazy. They can say whatever the hell they want. Because now everything he says is, it's not true. But, but from living in the neighborhood where he lived. And meeting people that actually went out there and saw the stuff and the look in their eyes. I mean, they saw it real testament from real people in this neighborhood. That is a lot of history here. My next door neighbor, uh, he actually had lots of interactions with Bob Lazar and actually went out and, and uh, proved everything I've seen in the videos. He he's, was one of the people there with him. I've never met Bob Lazar personally, but I've met people that work with him. And uh, <laughs> I wish I could have I could have been there too. I mean, talking about two, three in the morning watching UFOs fly. So Bob's uh, history here in this neighborhood is still alive and well. Well, it, through some of us, yeah. And, and anybody I see just like you, a, a, a photographer, I see, hey, you know, that's Bob Lazar's house. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a pretty damn neat, you know, Bob Lazar. <laughs> There's so much stuff that we're not being told that it'd be foolish not to believe him. I mean, why would people just make crap up? I mean, he's not crazy. He wasn't crazy then. My neighbor's not crazy. They live normal lives. It, it's uh, not an attention-seeking thing. Me and other people have seen these things. What about New Mexico? What about Arizona? All these lights, we've all seen something. Right. And not some bullshit video, you don't know if it's been made up or made. People have seen stuff and no one's there to explain it. To see something like that, you're never gonna forget it. But somebody telling you an exact time, exact place to go see something and then it happens, I mean, how's that gonna give you chills down your spine? I mean, I have met people in this neighborhood that have had interactions on the mountains and seen the UFOs with Bob Lazar. So that's, that's one soul on this earth that uh, definitely could uh, testify to it. That's not just Bob. If someone they could back up that story. This week we've heard the contention of UFO researchers that there is a secret government within our government. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. They're being test flown and uh, basically just analyzed. What was your function of working on this? You were doing what? What was your job? We were to reverse engineer the power and propulsion system of this craft and see if it can be duplicated with available materials. I just want to go over with you what it is that you saw to draw it out for people, to make a sketch. As you're seeing it, as if you're there at that moment, kind of go back in the past. It takes different views to show you different places. I'll draw you what the craft essentially looked like. I haven't done this in a really long time. I mean, it had the classic 
most of it the classic shape. However, that didn't come out that bad this time. So basically, that's the shape of the craft. It's the thing I termed the sport model. Underneath this floor, there are three, three large cylindrical devices hanging from the floor. These are on mounts that allow them to completely swivel up to 180 degrees and in 360 degree rotation. Directly above each one is a small rectangular object. This is on the floor above. And these are the gravity amplifiers themselves. Looking down from the top, you'd have the center. In the very center, there is a small reactor. Surrounding this in three equally spaced areas are the amplifiers. So this is looking at it sideways, this is looking at it down from the top. And under these amplifiers, underneath, on the floor below, are the gravity emitters. So it's the reactor here, powering the gravity amplifiers. Gravity amplifiers output goes into the gravity emitters at the bottom, and the resulting gravity beam or anti-gravity wave can be pretty much put anywhere you want to. Um, there was another level up here. Now I had access and was permitted to view and look at the operation of this main level with the gravity amplifiers and the level below uh, the gravity emitters. There is a level above which consisted of these two areas that I'm not all that familiar with. I assume these to be some sort of navigational engine. Uh, people call these large black rectangular areas on the top portholes. I believe they were some planar sensor array that just took in information from the surrounding area, whether it be patterns of stars or what have you. Uh, and there was their version of a computer or something to make determinations here that takes input from those sensors and then let the craft know how to orient itself and where it was in space. So that's what I assume to be up there. I don't know for a fact. Again, that was not part of my job and I was only led to believe that. The center antenna is really an extension of the reactor in the center. And that's a waveguide, which allows the uh, the emission of the gravity wave, which forms kind of a heart shape over the whole the whole craft. That's how it creates its distortion. These uh, gravity emitters can be swung all the way up to 180 degrees. And this allows the craft to essentially stand on two of them and hover while this one swings up and creates a distortion in front of it allowing the craft to slide forward. So that's how their low power mode, uh, Omicron configuration operate. The Delta configuration uses all three. And unlike science fiction movies where you see flying saucers just flying along like that, they actually fly belly first. The craft flies along, leaves the atmosphere of the planet, it turns its belly to the destination. The three amplifiers focus in on the destination, and that's how it proceeds. So that's basically the operation of it and overall how things were laid out inside the craft. There were three seats in here, and uh, just around the, uh, uh, the reactor. There were no controls, no buttons, no anything. Everything has a nice smooth curve to it. There are no right angles anywhere. Everything is exactly the same color. And uh, whether it's metal or some other advanced material, I don't know, again, that was part of the metallurgy division. And uh, all I can say is it felt cold like metal. 
um, but its actual composition, who knows if it was ceramic or, you know, again, some advanced alloy or something along those lines. But uh, the manufacturing technique is unknown and certainly was back then. Um, today, 30 years later, there are things like 3D printing, and now that kind of begins to make sense because it looks like this craft was just built from the ground up like a 3D printer. And that would be about the only way to produce some of the things we saw, because there were no fasteners anywhere. It was just all together, not even a seam. So, um, I don't know. How that was actually assembled is a good question, but I bet it was something along those lines, some gigantic printing mechanism or something we would consider a printing mechanism that actually put this together. When you were allowed to go into the middle and look down into the bottom layer of this craft, what did it feel like to step in? Like, was it instantaneously obvious to you that we could not make this upon walking in the craft? Yeah, it was really, and pardon the pun, it was really unworldly. Everything, <laughs> again, was alien. It really was in that, uh, again, nothing is always completely monochrome in things people build. There is always seams. There's always something other than a radius of curvature. There's a sharp edge. There's some kind of control. Everything was different. There wasn't even wires in this thing as we started to dismantle it. But um, it was more of an ominous feeling because we really didn't know what we were getting into how dangerous it was, and certainly didn't know how dangerous it was to remove anything or change it. Look, I mean, we have energy sources this day and age. You can't just remove caps, you know, off of reactors and have a peek inside and see what's going on. And we really didn't understand the energy source. We had no idea what, you know, a housing might be holding back. So... It was fearsome technology, as I've said before. And, uh, you know, so was it exciting going inside? Not exciting in that way. It was exciting because we were afraid. Uh, and really just looked around inside. The reason for going in was to have a look. There was a little access port here where you could push it open and stick the top half of your body in, hang upside down and look and see the orientation and how the gravity emitters were hanging from the, you know, the floor above. What was your first indication that it was not human? It was not ours. It was not made for us. Well, certainly the size. I mean, this was only about a little over 50 feet in diameter. The only time you could ever stand up would be the middle. So nobody would make something like this. It was extremely uncomfortable to move around in. The seats were not for full-size humans. Everything looked like it was child size. And the access port I couldn't dream of getting through. So there was certainly something smaller operating this. The opening port was like a, 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 hexagon, a hexagon honeycomb with an edge cut out. And if you grab the edge and just pushed a little bit, the honeycombs would all collapse, some sort of flexible metal and all snap open. And I remember seeing or saying to myself, that's, that's something we could make today. That, that's really, because it has a lot of strength standing on it, but no strength the other way. So you can pop it open, use it as an access port, snap it closed, and it would support weight on it. Uh, something very simple, not that it really stood out. I was standing in a you know, ocean of alien technology, but I think the reason it stood out was there's something I understand, you know, and nothing. I, I don't understand anything else. So I kind of grabbed onto that. It's like, I, I see what you did, guys. Here, not anywhere else. Um, so the other fascinating thing was um, it was essentially a pipe. I mean, if you want to just give you analogies, these gravity emitters look like 55-gallon drums. And a big, oh, I'd say four inch diameter pipe, oh, maybe 10 inches long, can, maybe a little longer, connected the top of the drum to the floor above. It's a solid, thick pipe. Somehow, they were able to manipulate the structure of that pipe where it would just bend. 
as if it was made of clay. So they can apply some form of control to it and have a solid piece of pipe move like a tentacle. So they can get very fine movements and adjust and point these things wherever they were and then stop stimulating the stuff and they were locked in place like it was welded on there with a giant pipe. How do you know that they could bend these pipes that way? We did, we had one of these setups in the lab. When you had made adjustments, it would move, it would bend? Yes. That is putting out a gravity wave. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, when we bench tested this setup, yeah, it worked. You know, you've got these seats, no seat belts, and then it goes belly facing where it's supposed to go. How did the occupants you know, not fall out of the seats? What's that about? Well, you're thinking about flying around a single source of gravity below you, and then as you move around, you'll flop, but you're canceling out gravity from every, anywhere else. You're canceling out gravity, inertia, and all other effects, and the only gravity there's going to be is the center is probably going to be the reactor itself. So you're always just pulled and held to the floor here. That's always the ground. So, so no matter how you're oriented, this is always where your pull is. So you'd never even know that you're upside down, you know, in relation to the earth or other things. It creates this field around you, almost heart-shaped, and then that kind of is a cocoon of what we'd call gravity, and it holds you so you can just be inside of that field, and then wherever you end up focusing, that's where you're gonna to fall to. Right. That's the propulsion, okay. Now, of course, we never, at least I never had information of us flying the craft at that performance level, but it's assumed that's how it works from the information we, we gleaned. But you saw this craft? Oh, I saw this craft and these work, and you can certainly extrapolate if three of them together worked like this first one, we know how it, how it operated. So there's you know, extremely high confidence in that. And the craft that you're drawing here is the one that you guys would take parts out of and work on. Yes. Is it also the one that you saw the test of? Yes. So they were able to take parts out and put them back in. That's no, 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 no. They did not. This flew on two amplifiers. This was already removed. I mean, I should put a dotted line around here. This was on the bench in our room. When I went in there, this was already out. And it still worked. I, I can't imagine how they made the decision to remove that. I'm really glad I wasn't there. At some point you were inside and it was activated and something happened to the inside of the wall. I guess that is an important part. The other, to explain that, around the wall, it was essentially a, a set of archways which were extruded from the wall all around. And we later found these out to be, I guess this is a big thing I should touch on. Uh, we found these to be waveguides. And this is how the gravity field was being manipulated. It almost looked like it was just a design element, but it was, it became very obvious that nothing here uh, was done for aesthetics. Everything had a functional purpose. And, you know, even in our spacecraft, Everything has pretty much a functional purpose. There are no house plants or anything just to look at there. But these archways were extruded from the base wall. And for the most part, it seemed they were all the same. But in fact, they were not. One of them, and just putting this here, so they looked like this all the way around. One of them was different, and the one time I was in there, there were other people also working on there in their own particular group. They activated this by some means, and we could see from inside, we could see right through that. I guess the modern day analogy would be a electrochromatic glass, where it's normally opaque, some energy is applied to it and it becomes transparent. And whatever the other group was doing, this panel here, underneath this archway, became transparent, and we can see the, the hangar outside. They also did something else, and we can see something, the only thing I can relate it to is some sort of writing, some kind of symbols like that. I'm assuming that's some sort of written 
written language, I, I really don't know. That's, that's a guess on my part. But there were symbols that were displayed here, and then it went back to looking outside. So somebody had a handle on how to control what was going on without any wires or switches. So that was kind of good to see some, somebody was making some progress somewhere. Again, we weren't even permitted information about that, and I was fortunate enough just to see it. So um, now is it possible these other archways uh, did something too? Uh, it could be. I didn't see it, but I know this one, this particular one did. This is an alien spacecraft. Right, right, obviously. Another entity had to make this. Right. Reality simply isn't what it used to be. Things are not what they seem. Everything around us is a mental construct. We create our own reality. Breaking that down is hard to do. And once it's done, there ain't no coming back. Imagine a place between shadow and substance. A place where the world is just thin. Not many pass through here. They just tend to get burnt up, infected. You see, knowledge is corrosive, like a, an acid. The mind can unwrap, so you're gonna to wanna to keep your wits about you. You gotta show grit and patience. They say the secret of the finder. Sometimes that's true. You better hope that's true. Welcome to the world of extraordinary beliefs. secret of spots on the planet is located on the northeast edge of the Nevada test site and is said to be where numerous top secret weapon systems have been tested over the years. According to some UFO researchers, it's also where the government is test flying alien spacecraft. It sounds pretty far out, but some Las Vegas residents report having seen these flying saucers. A local scientist who says he worked at Groom Lake and saw the saucers joins us in tonight's interview. He has asked that his identity be shielded. Sir, how do we know you are who you say you are and that you actually have knowledge about what's going on at Groom Lake? Well, I guess there's no way you could really know. Uh, uh, there's really no way I could prove it without revealing my identity and getting myself into more trouble than I have already. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying disks, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. You say there's nine saucers. How, how are those tests going? Uh, as far as what? As far as whether they're successful and, and, and that sort of thing. Oh, well, some of them are 100% intact and operate perfectly. Uh, the other ones are being taken apart. Uh, I was involved mainly in, in propulsion and the power source. Where, where did we get these saucers? Uh, how did they come into the hands of the government? I haven't the slightest idea, and uh, you have to understand the information is very compartmentalized, and uh, I was only allowed information that pertained particularly to what I was involved in. But I mean, couldn't, couldn't our government have made them as opposed to getting them from some alien beings? Totally impossible. Uh, the propulsion system is an, uh, a gravity propulsion system. The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, this technology does not exist at all. In fact, one of the reasons that I'm coming forward with this information, it's uh, not only a crime against the American people, it's a crime against the scientific community, which I've been part of for some time. 
or actively trying to duplicate these systems, yet they are in existence now and basically in the hands of the government. What would happen to you if the government learned that you were giving us this information? Anything could happen. I don't know. It's, uh, I haven't the slightest idea. Well, you said uh, you referred to getting into trouble. Have you had some repercussions already? Yeah, I've been threatened with uh, uh, being charged with espionage. Uh, I've had my life threatened by them, my wife's life threatened by them, and uh, uh, I, I mean, I don't know where else you can go from there. Well, we want to thank you for joining us. Pretty interesting stuff you've got to say. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Well, more news in just a moment. Now, first we go to Dan Rather in Beijing for a look ahead at the CBS Evening News. CBS Evening News from China. We'll have extensive coverage of Mikhail Gorbachev. The live interview with the shadowy dentist drew international attention. Portions were broadcast by radio in six European countries and in a nationally televised TV special in Japan. Despite numerous inquiries and feelers, Dennis has remained anonymous until now. His real name is Robert Lazar. He says he was hired to work at an area called S4, which is a few miles south of Groom Lake. At S4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. Work Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. When somebody understands fission and fusion and the inner workings of nuclear reactions, they can't not know how to make a bomb out of it and just make a nuclear reactor to make power. like a Twilight Zone episode, just kept getting stranger. The fact that that was happening at all was the weirdest part. Look, it's been 30 years, and all of a sudden you raised it to this level? You know, this is a powerful technology, fearsome technology, and you just don't want everyone to have it'll become obvious how to make constructive as well as destructive devices from it. It's my only guess as to why they have never released information. It's kind of difficult once you release the technology to be analyzed and give it to everyone. They can just run with it. You really can't keep the weapon potential hidden. You really can't. Look, with ET technology, you can literally rule the world. When you're going to an investigative reporter at a news station and you are outing the most secret project ranked higher than the, the H-bomb mm -hmm. and you're essentially putting your face and voice on the news, although you did a shadow interview first, you put yourself out there. That's because you were scared. Yeah, there's no, no question. I, it's easy to joke about or laugh or remember just the good times now almost 30 years later. But at the time, yeah, I was petrified. This was no joking around. I mean, it was hard to sleep. I had a people wait up at night and keep an eye out. It, it, it was crazy. It was crazy. It absolutely destroyed my life. I mean, I, I weighed like 119 pounds or something then. I was stressed out all the time. It's safe to say your employers were pissed as fuck. Obviously, they were pissed. What was the fear from at that time? I was really afraid of the people that worked at S4. I had no idea how far they would go. How angry they were with me was made really clear. So uh, there were so many things that happened. I mean, uh, people breaking into my house, searching my car, even when I went to the gym to work out. And I mean, I had friends with me that saw things like this happening. And even they were afraid. So I, yeah, I left in constant fear at the time.
This is the hard part of the story for people to understand. It's uh, they, they, they don't really get a sense of what it was like because literally you had to be there for some of this. I lived through it. I, I know what it was like, what B Bob was going through at that time. They were breaking into his house and playing mind games. You know, they'd leave the doors open, they'd leave the drawers open, nothing's taken. They'd write things on his blackboard or erase things, move things around. He goes to the gym with his, with his buddy and he's kind of scared. So he's got an Uzi in his car. He comes out an hour later after working out, the doors to the car are open, the windows are down, the glove box is open and the Uzi is laying there on the front seat. That wasn't a burglary, that was somebody messing with him. That stuff really happened. I can remember getting calls from Bob in, in the night, just that he had had somebody in his house messing with him. I go over to see him to calm him down and he's walking around with his Uzi peeking out the windows. Sounds paranoid, uh, but, but as the old saying goes, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean somebody isn't after you. And in his case, they were. They were messing with him, that was real. It's both uh, frightening, and infuriating. Do you feel that you have been utilized in this mechanism of information release? I think I'm doing something that somebody wants done. I, I think I have been used in that regard. I think somebody, maybe not all of them, but some of them wanted this stuff out. They wanted to see how it would fly. I think that's why Bob Lazar was hired out there. I think on many levels, it does not make sense that they would put him in that job. Um, but the fact is they did. He was out there and he was working on this stuff for a short period of time. I think they probably selected him because they knew he wouldn't keep his mouth shut. And that story would come out. And then I did my part of it in telling it to the world. I suspect that they figured I would quit uh, and that I would give up that I wouldn't continue it for another 25 years and still be plugging away at it. But in the, in the larger context, I think I was probably doing something that they wanted done. Let's get this story out there, see if people freak out, and then we can always pull it back. We can discredit the guy. Uh, I do think that there have been attempts to discredit me, that, uh, that they've tried to make a run at me with false information. If Bob worked at Los Alamos in any kind of sensitive or classified position, then it becomes reasonable to say he could have worked out at S4. Uh, all the stuff about his educational credentials aside, if he was there, I don't really care whether he went to MIT or not. And I think we established beyond any question that he was there. I mean, I interviewed people that he worked with who said he was there. We had him in the phone book. We had him in the, uh, in the uh, newspaper. I had confirmation from the company that, that recruited him, Kirkmeyer, that said that, yeah, we hired him and they were gonna give me the records and then they said no. I know that the lab lied to me. Uh, I know that they, they thwarted my attempts to prove that he was there, but he was there. And one of the reasons I know he was there is because he took us in. We went there on a weekend. My photographer and I, Bryant Blackburn, flew to Los Alamos and went to the lab and Bob took us in. It was like a, a rabbit in his burrow. I mean, he was taking us through buildings. Obviously he knew it, his way around. We were there, he took us in. Uh, I guess, you know, I, I guess there might be some other explanation for how he was able to have that access, but I'd like to know what it is. This is a reluctant UFO messiah. The only reason he came out uh, to talk to us again is because I bugged him about it uh, relentlessly. And he finally relented and came out, but he wasn't happy about it. Nothing good comes from the UFO field for him. It does nothing but cause him trouble. If he had to do it over again, I, I suspect he wouldn't do it uh, because it changed his life. And there was a part of him that would really like to still be working on that stuff. I mean, it was really amazing technology. The most amazing technology he's ever seen. Uh, the descriptions of the golf ball experiment, where you throw a golf ball at this force field and it bounces off, or uh, the, the, this, this demonstration where it freezes time. It freezes a flame. How the flame could still be burning uh, without moving, uh, without consuming this this candle, how does that work? Even if he has been led down a path and, and me along with him, that they have shown him glimpses of something for their own reasons, run it up a flagpole, let's see how, how the public reacts and then discredit him down the line. He acknowledges that's possible. And, I, and I've thought about it all the way along, that we're, we're being played with, but 
the idea that Bob was a disinformation agent or part of a, a program to mislead the public is wrong. I, he's not. And I can say that after knowing the guy for a quarter of a century. The story he told then is the story he tells now. He didn't add to it. He's not making it more elaborate. Uh, he's not remembering new parts of it. It's the same story. It's consistent all the way through. He's telling me something that really happened to him. The mountains appear to float on dry lake beds, like spaceships from another world. They seem to ride on a viscous material channeled through empty space by heat that rises and separates. It vitrifies everything it contacts, like a, like a green glass honey. A goddamn psychedelic liquid drowning the emptiness with imagination. With imagination. This desert is pocked and punctuated by a thousand gaping holes created in a thousand atomic blasts that define an era. What are they building in the desert north of Las Vegas? What are they hiding? What are they hiding? What the fuck are they hiding? I knew the date of a specific test. We rented a car, took my wife, a few friends, and drove out to this, this place and turned the lights out and snuck into a little area, and uh, uh, we all watched it. What made you start showing your friends exactly where and when the test flights were going to be? Why did you do that? Start showing people the flying saucer? I, at that time, I was beginning to worry that I was going to suddenly disappear or something like that. So I finally broke down and told my close friends really what my job did entail, what I was doing. And I knew the test flight schedule. So I knew when to go out, what time to go out, and brought them there at that time. And on schedule, the craft came up, you know, did incredible maneuvers and flew around and then, then landed. So I wanted them to witness what I was, so there'd be something backing up what I was saying. And certainly witnessing the craft actually being tested was you know. What turned them on you, the people that you worked with at S4, what turned that administration of people against you? When did it become dangerous for you? Why did it become dangerous for you? I think that the start of it was the fact that they were monitoring my phone calls. And at the time, my wife was having an affair because she thought I was having an affair by disappearing at night going to this job. And they were monitoring that. Now, one of the requirements for clearance at this level is having a stable family life. You can't have some, you know, tumultuous situation going on. So they want, you know, just a, a happy, calm, normal person. I was beginning to move out of that category when they saw that this, you know, affair was taking place, felt this is going to be a problem, so let's not have him come into work anymore until this resolves itself. And that's when I started bringing some friends out going, well, they're not asking me to come into work anymore and they're not just going to let me go with all this knowledge that they gave me. So that's when I decided to show a close group of friends what was going on just in case I did suddenly disappear or something like that. This is what I was doing. The easy way out is to say he's a liar, he's making it up. It's hard to go ahead and accept the possibility that he's telling the truth. But if I did not believe it, if uh, I thought for a moment that he was lying about it, I'd be done with it. I wouldn't still be supporting it 30 years later. Your life has been under a microscope. Every word you said for 30 years recorded has been under a microscope. And that's, that's affected you. Yeah, of course it is. It affect anybody. How, how has it affected you? In the way I talk and how much I do. I'd rather not you know, in a public forum, I'd rather just not say anything. Why do you think people are so obsessed with every word that you say about your experiences, you know, working They're at just looking for a way to, uh, to look for an inaccuracy and, and to be able to discount the whole thing. Oh, he said this one time and said it's slightly different this time. You know, obviously he's making it up. No, that's just the first word that entered my mind. You know, I don't put that much thought into it when I'm saying it. Look, as, as much as a lot of people hate it, this stuff really happened. I mean, if it bothers you, that's too bad. I, I think that's just hard for people to accept. I mean, so... Yeah, it would be... Look, I fully understand. I would feel the same way. 
I'm not sure I would believe my story. Boy, there's not enough evidence, you know, but uh, I couldn't discount it either. Since the New York Times story broke, since Lou Elizondo came forward, said those videos went public, the world is now talking about UFOs in a more serious vein. I think that's a good thing, and I think it reflects positively on Bob Lazar's story, and I hope that the world will take another look at it. The fact is, the people that know him best believe him the most. I hope that one thing that comes across in your film is the real Bob. Once you get to know him, it becomes much more plausible as a story. You saw alien ships. Yeah. You worked on a gravity wave amplification system trying to figure it out. Right, a propulsion system and a power source that's completely unknown to mankind. And there's no way human beings could have made it. There is no way human beings could have made it, under any circumstances, in any country, anywhere, period. And, and for 30 years, you, you are telling us the truth. You bet. This shit happened. You got it. You know, the, the fact is that that raid that happened in Michigan, that's a very dramatic and very important development. They weren't there looking for records about some uh, customer he had a couple of years ago. They were looking for 115. Reality simply isn't what it used to be. Things are not what they seem. Everything around us is a mental construct. We create our own reality. Breaking that down is hard to do. And once it's done, there ain't no coming back. It's true. What I have seen is true. I don't know about the big story, where they came from, what they're like, and and uh, but certainly these crafts came from another, uh, not not just another planet, another solar system entirely, extremely far away, and they're here. This week we've heard the contention of UFO researchers that there is a secret government within our government. Exactly what's going on up there? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying disks, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. They're being test flown and uh, basically just analyzed. This is released by the Department of Defense. They, they authorized the release. This is one of three videos. This one, where I want to show it to you, they call it the gimbal. Why it's interesting is because here's a fighter pilot. He's tracking this object. You can see the shape of it, and it does this move. And when it does this move, it doesn't change its velocity, its speed, anything. So I want to see at the end of this video, which is only 30 seconds, okay. what you think of the movement. And I know it's like an IR video. It's not that great, you know. But just I won't. Yeah, I won't critique it. Right. Hey, this is a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, I'll take dude. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not. It is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's like another thing, it's rotating. So that's something that people comment on is as it's going, it's got this rotation mm -hmm. and it's not, um, you know, if what we're seeing is correct and, at, and, at, and it's rotating and it is actually shaped like that, let's say. It's kind of hard really to see the shape. I know, and, it's really hard. You know, is that in fact the shape or is that, it, if this is just a heat signature, are we seeing the bloom from it? You know, just the, you know, the, the, the infrared image 
I mean, what does the actual visible item look like? Is it, uh, and there's a little protrusion on the top, or in this case, the bottom there. You know, is that just heat or is that the shape of the craft? So we're not going to be able to answer that. A lot of people have the exact questions that you're asking there. The, is the, there any more of this? Is that this is this is the only video? There, there, there is there is more, but it's not declassified. It's not allowed to be out in the public. So the I happen to personally know these videos are longer. Okay. But what's been released to the public is small snippets because remember the 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 whole methods and that sort of thing. They don't want to release too much. Right. Any FLIR video is classified by nature because of what it could show to potential enemies. Right, Understood. So there, there are long, much longer videos. This is all we get. And I'm not asking you to validate what you're seeing here. No, people, I, I people, couldn't. Yeah, but, yeah, people uh, have huge questions. But why this is interesting, and a lot of people ask me, is that the craft will... It is interesting that it did rotate like that, because the craft that I worked on, that when it's, when it's going to travel a long distance, that is how it operates. It flies along and it, it puts its belly to the target and then brings all the amplifiers to power and, you know, it shoots off in that direction. Now, if yeah. it did something like that, I would say that's <laughs> yeah, we, we don't incredibly know. similar. Yeah, we don't know, but that is kind of the point of me showing that I wanted to talk to you about that. So you, you often discuss your the craft you worked on, how it's like this, and then it would turn its belly towards where it wanted to go. Yeah, if it's going to fly fast or long distances, it doesn't fly as it would in a science fiction movies. It flies with the belly, the bottom forward. Um, and, and the occupants, if there are occupants inside this craft, when it flips and points its belly somewhere, can you explain kind of what, what happens to those it's occupants? It's generating its own gravitational field, so it it really is not just shielded by its own field, but it the, the Earth's field, where you would think they would tilt up and they would fall down inside, that really has no bearing on it. The craft is generating its own gravity. They're standing straight up or whatever, you know, your glass of water is sitting there and it's not spilling. I mean, the bottom of the craft is always pulling all matter to it. So the way it's designed is that if there's occupants in it, as it were to move, the occupants would not notice a single difference in the gra their gravitational No, nothing field. at all. So this craft can At move. any speed. So, so the Tic Tac, um, Commander David Fravor talks about watching this object that was like a Tic Tac, you know, similar mm -hmm. to 46 feet, whatever, and like, it would bounce. He said like, a, he said to me personally, like a ping pong ball in a glass. Bah, 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 bah. Sometimes it would slow down and it would move and then choo, choo, and it, would, it, it had no, it didn't have to slow down, he said, as it went to, from one point to another. Just, it would bounce off, you know, and, and you know, right. go one direction and come back. So that's what you're talking about and what you call it, inertia, or what you said, how you explain that. But, well, I mean... It, you know that it might only look that way too. It's really difficult if you difficult to to know for sure because if you are manipulating the space around the craft, I mean time and space around there, it may just appear that way. You know, it may just wow. be an artifact yeah. of the way the craft's operating. It's not really bouncing back and forth like that, but it's just appearing that way. The way they're distorting the space and moving around. But either way. Either way, it's something we. It's a gra it's a gravity driven craft because you need if you're distorting. Yeah, time if you're coming or, to a dead stop, you know, from high speed or or making ridiculous movements like that, shaking back and forth. Um, yeah, that's not a convention. It's not conventional technology at all. So when when I told you about the way that Commander Fravor, who is you know one of the top fighter pilots in America, especially at that time, and he described this craft moving the way it did, you said that's got to be if it moved like that, it's got to be. A gravity propelled craft. Yeah, you really can't move any other way like that. And so, like the craft you worked on, that is the key the gravity propulsion. Right. Okay. So, these videos that have come out, in some ways, we've talked about this, this is in very small ways vindicated some of your story. The government has admitted they have a, a, a UFO program, albeit a reactionary UFO program. To military sightings. Right. They well, back in 89, I think they said the only UFO research or program they did was Project Blue Book, which had come to an end a long time ago, and there was nothing going on. So if they admitted there was a program, so they're, they're admitting that that was a lie, and that there really was a program continuing, which is a big step. I'm surprised they did that.
And they also admitted that there are materials associated with UFOs, but inside sources say that, that there's actually a lot more than just a metal that was discharged from, from a UFO, that they may even have a craft. Inside sources meaning people like George Knapp who have their finger on the pulse of all this. Mm -hmm. If they admit something beyond the fact that they just have alloys, although that's a big deal. You know, that they have That's alloys. a tremendous deal. It's a tremendous deal. And they said that the alloy itself, they're calling it a metamaterial, that the design of the material is essential to the way the craft functions, which kind of makes sense. If it's, That's not a surprise, yeah. Right. Anyway, so it's a new day. It's quite interesting. Just thought I'd show you this and, you know, let's see. Yeah, I'd sure like to see the rest of it, but I'm sure everybody would, too. Everybody would, but, too. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I'm hopeful that something's going to happen, but at least we get little bits. And, you know, in little ways, you, you and George, you know, putting his neck out on the line because he believed you from day one. George he didn't Knapp. just believe me. He spent a lot of time and we traveled all over. He went you with know. you into Los Alamos to your work. Right. He put you through two or three polygraph tests. Yeah, this was no, no. George Knapp had you thing. sit down with people who he knew worked at Area 51 and landed, you know, from McCarran on mm -hmm. the Janet flights, landed there, and they asked you questions and went put you through your paces. He doesn't advertise this, but the people he sat you with, they said, oh, yeah, he's saying it right. So, so that's another confirmation that George, George didn't just believe you. He put you through your paces. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, it took a, a long, long time before. People don't appreciate was, that. They just get the end result, which mm -hmm. is that people like George vouch for you. Mm -hmm. But th but they didn't get to hear all the things he he did to to poke at you to see is Bob. Yeah, it was years to, to get to that point, literally. So, and you uh, no, and over that time you did develop a friendship with George. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. How can we you not did. going through something? Yeah, like we that. spent a lot of time together. Yeah. Sure. And and he found your your name, the phone book at Los Alamos, mm -hmm. you know, showing that even though they denied you were never there, there you were in the phone book. Right. I as it. well as Joe, the person that I worked with at Los Alamos. George know. interviewed Joe. Vanette. Right, and he was in the phone book, you know, with me. We worked in the same place, so. Um, I actually, the world has never seen you, like, in Los Alamos, right? But I actually have some home videotape of you where you're walking through Los Alamos with Joe Vaninetti. You guys are just walking around laughing about how people say you never worked there. And you're in Los oh, Alamos no, okay. together. I have that footage. Oh, Wow. And you also go to this one place, and you, you find a piece of concrete in the ground. And in that concrete, you brush off some pine needles, and you go, oh, my God. And in that footage is your name with, like, 1981. There you were at Los Alamos, and you had carved your name in cement. Oh, you know what that is? That's where we put in, back then, they were called Earth Stations. Big satellite dish. But, you know, now they're two feet. They used to be seven feet across and larger. And... Um, yeah, I remember putting in that pad and putting in a big, you know, Earth Station satellite receiver there. But yeah, that was around right. 82 or 83, something like that. No, maybe... Yeah, I don't remember what... I don't remember but what it was year, 80, 81, yeah. it doesn't matter. But, but it was in Los Alamos, And yeah. you made a joke and you brushed off the pine needles and you go, oh, yeah, see, Stan, I never worked there. And, you know, you, <laughs> it was funny because you just, like, rediscovered it. So you've never been, like, really deeply interested in like proving everybody wrong that you're right and and that's been admirable no no i don't care in fact like i always said i i prefer everybody don't believe it because then nobody bothers me they say, yeah. hey, he's crazy and that's it yeah it makes your life if um, everybody believed the story um i would be hounded till the end of time so really i i right. don't, don't really care well that is the deal if everybody did believe your story um it, we'd be looking at something totally different I mean, that, that might blow shit up. Reality simply isn't what it used to be. Things are not what they seem. Everything around us is a mental construct. We create, we create our own reality. reality. Breaking that down is hard to do. And once it's done, there ain't no coming back.
dropping bombs in the middle of the desert, all that atomic energy fused sand together. That's what gives it this really nice glassy green, you know, texture that people really look for in it. So, and it's rare, you know, it's running out. It's definitely a, you know, there's not enough on the planet for it to be an infinite resource. So, can't even do any more tests. So that's why it's so rare. All of a sudden, you're selling a whole bunch of Trinitite. Yeah. And why, why is that? Well, apparently, Twin Peaks came out with an episode last week or so where they make a... It's a really cool shot of the bomb going off in 1945 in White Sands, New Mexico. And all it is is a two-minute close-up of the bomb going off. And then it goes deeply into, like, this atomic, you know, everything's going off, exploding and all this, you know, fusion. And that's it. That's all that happens in the episode. It's the only mention of it, really. And then, I guess later in the episode, you see a bug crawl out of what the aftermath of the bomb. But there's no explicit mention of Trinitite or anything like that. And we, sales just went through the roof. Like, we hadn't sell, we sold more in, the, in one week than we had all year of this stuff. So it was, but yeah, it was bizarre. I thought for sure there would be an explicit mention, like you said, with the Trinitite ring or something, but nothing. So that was it, really. It's really nice because you get to hold that, like a bomb exploded in my hand, basically. That's why I really like Trinitite, so. And it looks pretty cool, too. It's pretty nice that you have the genuine piece of American history be able to hold it in your hand, so that's why I like it a lot. And it's all, like, it's called Trinitite because it was from the first atomic test. It was called the, tri uh, was the Trinitite bomb? Trinity test site. Trinity test site, that's what it was, yeah, and that's why it's called um, turn it tight. That's the only reason. So, yeah. I love my job. And there's a lot of craftsmanship in the stuff that I do. I really like working with my hands. It's a really unique job. I don't think there's any other job where you get to do this kind of stuff every day. I work for Bob Lazar. Well, what more can I ask for? That was kind of a coffee drop moment when I realized who my boss was. Because when I interviewed with him, I, had, I thought I was just some guy. And then I go back home and I, I kind of start putting two, to, two and two together when I, you know, research what, who am I working for and all that. And I was like, oh my God, I'm working for Bob. Because this is a guy I'd known about since I was 12 years old. So my uncle showed me a conspiracy video. You know, it's the Bob tape with, uh, with the interview with him at S4 and Area 51 from the 80s or so. And I remember that because that was like the only video I'd ever seen where I actually trusted the, it was like the only conspiracy video where I actually trusted the guy and what he was saying. So flash forward 10 years later and I'm actually interviewing with him and I'm like, oh my God, I get to work for this guy. The bonus is, is that he's actually a really cool boss. I never, I never asked for that. I never would have expected that, but he's a really cool boss and he's a really cool guy. So that's what makes this job so awesome. I find him to be an endlessly fascinating person. He's always working on something different, something cool. And then he and I are always matched on curiosity about science in general. So that's the best part is that whenever he's coming up with something new, he'll come up to be like, hey, Zach, check this out, it's super cool. And I'm like, oh my God, you're right, it is. Just that kind of like curiosity about the natural world and science is what really motivates me to come into work, basically. Bob's not a scientist. Have you heard that stuff before? Oh yeah, oh yeah, you hear that all the time. Or he, you know, he's a liar, he never worked for Area 51. That's why they can believe whatever they want. You know, the Bob that I know is like one of the most honest people that I've ever met. And I love his ethics as a businessman. That's kind of something that I try to, you know, propagate as a person as well. He's got really good principles. The more you get to know him, the more you realize he's telling the truth. Yeah, so, yeah, that's so. the bizarre part, is that his story's true. It's like the most unbelievable story in American history, and then it kind of clicked to me, is like, he actually worked there. It's like, it, that was the most unbelievable part to me. It's like, this whole time I thought he was just some crackpot. Honestly, I thought he was gonna be just some, you know, another guy that's propagating these UFO conspiracies, like we never landed on the moon. I think like the first week I worked here, I, I heard him call somebody out on the phone because they asked him, did we land on the moon? He's like, I personally know somebody who's been on the moon. And that kind of set the tone for me, like, he's not one of those guys. He doesn't want to associate with those guys. He doesn't want to be just some conspiracy nut. So that really kind of started to turn the wheels of like, you know, maybe his story's true. Maybe he actually did work there. And understanding him as a person, as being like somebody that's pretty honest, that only reinforces the idea that, yeah, he actually worked there. And he doesn't care. He doesn't care if you don't believe him. He doesn't care if you think he's a total crackpot UFO guy. Um, 
And that to me is probably the biggest indication because liars will always try to go the one step forward to make sure you believe their story. And he does not. He doesn't care. He doesn't want people to believe that actually. He'll, he just wants to be left alone and run his shop. That's it. So. He hasn't even told me the full story and I'm, I'm not gonna press him for it. It would be almost really convenient if, every, if everyone just didn't believe him. I think that's kind of the life that he wants. He just wants to be known as Bob. He just wants to live a normal life. So I guess if you know people didn't view him as the Area 51 guy, it'd be a lot easier to do that in his life. And that leads credence to you know me trusting him and trusting his story and all that, as unbelievable as it may be. You're telling me there's a different physics. That was your job, you were working on that. The science was something we were trying to figure out, but we knew how the devices would operate. You know, for instance, the propulsion of the craft. Everything that we have, whether it's a propeller plane or a jet or a rocket, it throws something out the back, either high-speed exhaust or a large volume of air. It's an action-reaction force. The action is you throw something out the back, and it moves you forward. That's how everything works. This is the first time there's a craft that's it's a reactionless craft. It's a field propulsion craft. And what it does is it creates a distortion in space and time in front of it, where space actually bends. It's just technology that doesn't exist yet. I mean, you're talking about uh, that there's... Science doesn't even know what gravity is much less how to produce it or control it. And here is a device that's producing it and controlling it. Put a bowling ball in the middle of your bed, and then a foot in front of it, take your fist and push down on the mattress. The bowling ball will roll towards it. And that's exactly how the craft works. It creates a distortion right in front of it, and the craft falls forward. There, so there's a different physics that we're not... Well, the science that explains how the technology works. I mean, it's all encompassed as one thing, alien technology and science. What is the big picture? What are the, what is the takeaway of your story after you're gone? You're not a, a rebel kid with a, with a jet car at Los Alamos today. Today's a different Bob Lazar, right? Right. What have we learned? What's, what's the message of your story? What's... The big thing is the suppression of extremely advanced technology and the suppression of unknown science. That's it. This is the uh, W-2 form from uh, the Department of Naval Intelligence. This was the paperwork I got from S-4 that has the MAJ on it. This is just a copy. Looks like it was copied through a fax. This is from a while ago. I haven't seen this in a long time. Anyway, that was uh, that was presented in court at one time. With respect to the material which I delivered to you on Thursday, can we make that a part of the record? We can. I think that uh, all of that is appropriate to put on the record. On we do have a W two form a record uh, that uh, shows that he worked for the United States Department of Naval Intelligence. I also note that he is in fact listed in the Los Alamos National Laboratory Telephone Directory. It's obvious that it's very difficult to get information on this. There's a lot uh, from government sources uh, enormous to get. Your Honor, what has happened with Mr. Lazar has had a devastating effect on him. 
and his ability to carry on with what he does here or elsewhere. He would like to be in a position to move on. Without describing specifically what's in the photographs. It's a magnificent, clear photograph of Papoose Lake taken in the daytime. During the daytime now, I got within a mile of the lake bed, and I had a powerful set of binoculars. Yes. It looked like a dry lake bed to me, nothing else. Well, that's what but it at is. at night, it was a different story. So he came from the other direction. He and came this from... is supposedly before S4 was built. Well... The 49ers came through before it, but right. he was out there when S4 was operating. He did his stuff when it was operating. He but did he, it like two years after Bob's story came out, but he had no idea about the UFO stuff. This guy is an archaeologist. His name is Jerry Friedman, and he had an idea. He wanted to track the uh, history of the 49ers, the groups of settlers who came across uh, the country um, uh, in uh, 1849 to get to the California gold fields. So he had a unique idea. He infiltrated the Nevada test site from the south and the west and traveled all the way across it. He sneaked across it, avoiding security, knew he was trespassing, but he would travel at night and hide under rocks and in caves during the day. He made it all the way up to Papoose Lake. Uh, this was in, see, the story is 1997. So it's after the Bob Lazar story has come out. This guy has no idea about Bob Lazar. He has no idea about flying saucers. He's not into that. But he traveled all the way up to Papoose Lake. And in his story, and I, I inherited a lot of his files, he says he was out at night by Papoose, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a door opens up. I mean, like just a door in space, a light, a bluish light that opened up, a doorway to who knows where, and then poof, it was gone. This guy had no idea about flying saucers, Bob Lazar, John Lear, any of this stuff, but this, that's the story he told. Unfortunately, as he traversed the Nevada test site, he ran into pockets of radiation and got contracted cancer and died. Uh, nonetheless, a lot of his files, a lot of his footage, his home video is here. I got it. It's a great story. The Arch. The huge stone arch depicted in this photograph does not exist, he says. The Department of Energy has decreed it so. Why? Because you and I might want to see it. And it's within a stone's throw of Yucca Mountain, which was designated as the nuclear repository. So he, he basically, he was petitioning Senator Reid to say, look, that stone arch is out there. The Department of Energy doesn't want to admit it because people would want to see it. And it's, it's a crime to not allow people to see it. As far as the Department of Energy goes, it doesn't exist because they don't want people asking to see it. They don't want people to access that. This guy did. He got out there, took pictures of it, and petitioned Senator Reid and others to acknowledge that it's out there and to let people in to see it. And that is, that is his, his Ark of the Covenant. That's what he went there for. He found that carving, 1849, in some rocks adjacent to Papoose Lake. And that was one brave dude and uh, committed. And that's pretty ballsy. Uh, the guy could have been arrested, thrown into jail. I think there were people who wanted to throw him into jail after he admitted his story that he'd trespassed because it was pretty clear that, in fact, he'd been out there. Two years after Bob's after story. Bob story. But how do you even get on that land without he getting... He came from the west. And they didn't stop him. No. Sensors, nothing. It is a gigantic facility. And he slipped in. My and mind can't... He traveled at night and he hid under rocks oh, and he caves. knew he shouldn't be there. Right. Oh, no. He knew he was trespassing. Well, shit. He didn't know for S4 to look for the fucking hole in the side of the mountain. Well, he didn't care about that. He was looking for... The rocks, they, there's that carving right there that he took the picture of. Fucking nerd! That's, that was the, that was the big prize for him. Uh, but while he's there hiding, that's when the door opened up. No way! He said he saw the door yeah. open up, and he's not a UFO. And he guy. doesn't know that shit. Has no idea no about this shit. No fucking way! And yeah. he died from radiation stuff. Yeah. Because he's sitting out there in the dark, 
Holy fuck, what the hell is that? And, it, and there's light inside. And a door opened from the side door. of the mountain. That's where Bob... Not in the, not on the side of the mountain, right in the middle of the desert. In nothing. Nothing's there. There is no side of the mountain. It opens in complete darkness in the middle of the desert. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You're not saying the floor opened up. No, I am saying, saying he's sitting of, here looking. Out of interdimensional space, yeah. a door opened with light behind it. Yeah. And he said, saw, said this to you. Yeah. And he, okay, but he came to talk because he knew you were into this area. Yeah, but he but came he to me, know. but I didn't get to do the story. It okay. ended up being somebody else because I wasn't there at the time. So there's some shit going on out at S4 that is way beyond our imagination. Yeah, and this guy, like I said, not a UFO guy. Dream, completely yeah. different ad adventure. It looked like a dry lake bed to me, nothing else. Well, that's what but it at is. At night, it uh -huh. was a different story. What did you see? I could time? clearly see what were security lights. Uh, on the perimeters, and I could see lights that opened and closed near the center uh, of the lake. I, I felt vibration. I know I wasn't imagining it because there were rivulets of sand coming down just on the other side of this little wash, and I could see them. And I thought, well, hey, uh, <laughs> an earthquake. Well, then I realized, no, this is not an earthquake. It continued and continued for maybe nearly two minutes. It, it's something they're testing, either directly underground, or I was feeling vibrations completely from Groom Lake. I don't know. I think if they'd have caught me in there, they'd lit me up like a Roman candle. Well, the briefings were blue folders and just had an overview of the other projects going on that could potentially connect to what we were doing. And there were three in particular. Yeah, our project was Galileo. And the two other ones were, were Project Sidekick, and that, that dealt with the, any other weapon potential of the craft. That, that was the biggest project on the base. The other one was Looking Glass, and that had to do with the effects of gravity's distortion and time, you know, about you know, potentially being able to get information forward through time. So there were other projects, again, dealing with other aspects of the craft, some biological and you know, like met metallurgical, things of that sort, but the fact that there is actually a concerted effort to use gravity to actually manipulate time, I actually would rather have been part of that project. Yeah.